welcome to the uh, Center for Biological Diversity's Food Justice Film Panel. We are speaking this morning with Jackie Patterson. She's the, correct me if I'm wrong, Senior Director for the NAACP's Environmental and Climate Program. Is that right? The Climate Justice Program, yes. Climate Justice. Sorry, but thank you for being with us, Jackie. And I'd love to hear more about what you're doing and what you're excited about and, and how people can get involved. Um, can you start by just talking a little bit about what you do? Sure. I, um, in, so the program overall, we do, as our primary focus is to support the capacity building of our state and local environmental and climate justice committees and at our branches, chapters, and our state conferences. And so to really affect change at the state and local policy level, as well as to some extent federal policy, and to also with the ultimate aim of, of changing the material conditions in their communities as it relates to uh, pushing back on environmental racism and pushing forward on the opportunities in the, and in, uh, in what we are aiming to be a new economy that's rooted in regeneration and um, self-determination and democracy and cooperation. So that's kind of our overarching aim. And we do that through doing research and policy analysis, through um, doing training um, and working with our units, uh, branches, chapters and state conferences on uh, strategy development, and then also helping to change the field of environmental and climate justice so that there is more, or, or the field of environmentalism and climate work, so there is more of an equity and justice frame and foundation to that work. So we also do a lot as it relates to being on advisory groups or steering committees or boards or putting out documents and, and giving input on, on policies or, uh, or, or reports or work of kind of everything from the legislatures to our peers in terms of nonprofit organizations and philanthropy. Sure. Um, can you explain from your perspective what environmental racism is? You're talking about adding that frame in, what climate justice is. Um, just so people maybe aren't as familiar with these specific terms, just maybe an example of what you're talking about. Yeah, so environmental racism is really refers to the ways that there are uh, uh, there's systemic racism that leads to uh, differential impact and exposure to environmental toxins and other uh, negative aspects of of uh, of the way we treat the earth and how it kind of <laughs> bounces and uh, affects our community. So, example would be that uh, African American are 71 percent of African Americans, according to last count live in counties in violation of, air, of federal air pollution standards compared to, unfortunately, 50, a little bit over 50% of the general population um, still. And so that um, African-American children, well, African-Americans are, 68% uh, of African-Americans live within 30 miles, which is kind of the cone of danger of uh, coal-fired power plants and so forth. And that we're more likely to live near air, near roadway air pollution, more likely to be exposed to indoor air pollution, more likely to live next to oil and gas facilities and incinerators and even nuclear reactors. And then and and then we see how our, how it plays out in terms of African American children being three to five times more likely to enter the hospital for, from an asthma attack, two to three times more likely to die of an asthma attack, and that's. Over with the national average, there's some communities where it's it's much worse. Like I was just reading about a community, and now I'm going to blank on which state it's in, where they were talking about how there's they're ten times more likely to enter the hospital from an asthma attack. Uh, I think it might have been in New York, one of the bureaus of New York, um, the boroughs, and. Uh, and so those kind of so those the, that kind of differential exposure and then the differential impact are the ways that we see environmental racism play out and the systemic inequities that led to that to those types of differential exposures including redlining segregate you know housing segregation and so forth are all were all kind of stepping stones to that differential exposure and differential impact 
And so we talk about climate justice and environmental justice. Environmental justice uh, is kind of the unequal uh, assignment, so to speak, of uh, the benefits and the burdens of, of environmentalism, I mean, of environment, environmental matters. So whether it's the unequal, uh, unequal exposure to toxins and emissions and pollution that I talked about, or it's the unequal access to, you know, parks or, you know, wildlands or, or, you know, green spaces or the positive aspects of the environment. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about how you see that play out in the food um, production, food consumption world as well? Absolutely. So we are seeing certainly with COVID-19, um, how it's playing, it really comes in a spark, stark relief, uh, those, these differentials, and then when we combine the climate impacts, it just exacerbates. So when I talked before about redlining and housing segregation, where uh, African-American families were, were being kind of uh, tracked into certain areas um, and tracked away from other areas, the areas that we're tracked into um, were also under resourced areas when it came to food, food, uh, healthy food access, whether it's grocery stores or whether it in, in these days in terms of farmers markets. So that means as a result, we are more likely to get our food from a corner store or a gas station or whatever, or, and then because we also have less act, less mobility, um, less likely to own a car and so forth, more likely to be dependent on public transportation, it means that um, it's much harder for us to get to a place where they, they do have healthy and nutritious foods. So therefore, uh, the the access to the food that we have ready access to is high in sodium, high in sugar, high in preservatives, um, and just overly processed. And so that type of uh, food diet is what has led to the proliferation of you know diabetes, um, hypertension, um, heart disease in our communities because of what we have access to. And then, and so we've seen how this has played out in terms of differential vulnerability in COVID-19. And then on the other side of the COVID-19, in terms of the economic crisis, when we see these long food lines um, and so forth at the food banks, it's uh, places that weren't even necessarily uh, food insecure before, but because of this economic crisis, they are, not to mention the places that were food insecure before, where it's uh, you know just extremely exacerbated. And so, and again, to even have the luxury to be able to be in a car to sit for six hours in the food line is uh, at the food banks is something that many in our communities do not have. So on the other, on the other side, um, we have uh, increased exacerbation of our existing food insecurity, in our communities and then more people being added to being food insecure as a result of the situation. And then when you add on top of that, the shifts in agricultural yields that result from climate change, which means that, you know, that whether it's drought area, areas of drought where food is not being produced the way it used to be, which also disproportionately affects the black farmers because we don't have necessarily the resources and the, the cushion or the, even the technology to be able to, to compensate for that or it's areas um, in the heartlands and so forth that are being flooded, where their crops are being um, flooded out as well. Um, all of that are, are impacts. And then I'll also say too, is even if we try to do local food um, um, projects, then that's also um, impacted because because uh, we're seventy-one percent of us live in uh, counties in violation of air pollution standards, and sixty-eight percent of us live next to coal fire power plants, and so forth and so on, it means that our soil is most likely toxic, much more likely to be toxic. So, for us to do um, even a garden is going to cost more than other people to do gardens who can maybe just kind of put a, a a trowel in the earth and and start and start planting. We have to think about how we're going to put together materials to do raised bed gardening or get our soil tested or these other things. So it just even adds in terms of trying to do local food projects. That is a lot. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Sure. Um, in terms of, of black farming, you mentioned that uh, black farmers have maybe obstacles uh, that we don't know about as much. Can you talk about some of those? 
Yeah, so some of it is uh, some of it is related to just the land um, and um, whether it's the the black belt uh, farming and there's a there's kind of proliferation of what they call non perking soil, which means that it doesn't it somehow doesn't absorb or I, yeah <laughs> there's a there's a challenge with the soil and um, and then on and then when we're talking about these drought conditions then some farmers are able to kind of really have, you know, uh, the, te the technology or the wherewithal to, to do, to change their irrigation practices or otherwise. But if farmers are already um, under-resourced, um, then, then being able to, um, be able, being able to kind of add technology or other approaches to, to, to adapt to the climate change impacts are harder for those farmers. Um, there's even his, history in terms, of, I was just doing a, a, a talk around housing and saw that there were a couple of policies that were passed around um, helping farmer, helping um, people who own farms to be able to have access to land and so forth. As, um, and but it was, but when that policy was passed, it was when it was before um, the emancipation, and so black 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 um, landholders and so forth subsequently didn't, you know, that policy was for a short term, and so they were already back then kind of starting on an uneven playing field because the other people had been helped by these subsidies that were provided before the, the emancipation when they weren't even eligible at that point. And so just going from there, just like, you know, uh, history of redlining and all of these other things, all of those vestiges of the Jim Crow law still live on today because we don't have the generational wealth because we were actually part of other people's generational wealth. So for us to be able to even compete because we don't have you know, our, our farmers don't have the same level of resources to even compete in the market is challenging. So it just kind of falls further and further behind and any shocks to the system like climate change, like a flood, like a drought, just, you know, you don't even have a place to start from in terms of being able to, to adapt to those changing conditions. Thank you so much. And so in the urban environments, we're seeing growth of urban gardens and food sovereignty movements. And so you have a project, I think it's called Seeds of Resilience and Resistance, is that right? Resistance and Resilience, yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with that and seed packets and, and trying to help people grow their own food? Yeah, absolutely. So again, we, we before, you know, since the program started to do uh, climate adaptation, and we, we really were emphasizing the need for local food movements, both in terms of filling the gaps that I just talked about uh, in terms of food access, but also because it also acts as mitigation because we know that the shipping and the trucking of food and so forth also uh, contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions. We also know that, um, that the commercial animal feeding operations and so forth also contribute in the way that, you know, uh, not only being inhumane practices, but also um, contributing to the methane emissions and so forth. So we've, we've all, we've, we've for a while had kind of uh, emphasis on food policies and so forth and, and, and trying to push us towards local food. But in the context of COVID-19 and seeing these impacts on both kind of the vulnerability side to COVID-19 and on the impact side of COVID-19, we decided we were going to, and, you know, supplement our policy work by actually helping folks to start some of these um, local local uh, community gardens and so forth in a more um, concrete way. So we decided to start to put together, and it started with kind of like a small scale, like we're just going to send a love letter with some seeds in it and, um, and, 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 and put it in like one of those plantable envelopes with a plantable card and so forth. And then it just grew in concept because of, as we watched the news and saw the needs were so great. So in the end, we decided that we were going to do seed packets for vegetable gardening, seed packets, packets for herb gardening. We did research on which, seed, which vegetables grow year round, which vegetables can grow anywhere, which uh, herbs are easiest to grow, and which ones are, um, can grow indoors. So we did all of that. And then we um, decided we were going to also, in addition to sending seeds, we were going to send vouchers for people to get materials for raised bed garden kits. 
and that we're going to send vouchers for people to be able to get kind of the growing kits for the for the herb garden indoor herb garden and then we um we decided we were going to put together videos for how to cook like cook with the vegetables that were you know the, with the packets that we're sending out so um cooking kind of whether it's uh plant-based or how to cook kind of side dishes that might go with other types of meals and also how to how to put together use videos to, to say how to put together these raised bed garden kits and these uh, herb garden kits and so forth and how to you know tips around growing and so forth and then we're good so we're going to do videos as well as some kind of live webinars and kind of create a cohort of people that would then be in like a growing community together across virtually um so that's kind of and then also do some big webinars with like big name folks talking about you know, doing their own growing or, or their plant-based diets and how, you know, just kind of helping people to, to think about these things and, and know what pathways that other people have taken in terms of really making sure that we, we do have food sovereignty, that we don't ever have a situation where we don't have control over whether we eat or not um, based on how much money we have in our pockets. Thank you so much. And how can people learn more about this project and support the work that you do. Oh, thank you very much. So with the Seeds of Resistance and Resilience, we are, so all of that, like we have these great ideas. We also had like uh, full-time work before this whole thing happened. So we um, ended up pulling together a group of volunteers who are now um, working on the project. And so, uh, so the idea kind of very far preceded the, the fruition. And so now we're at the point where we're finally gonna move towards fruition. So we'll, we'll start to post on our web page, uh, naacp.org, information on it, but you won't really find it now. But if people are interested in being involved in the project, we would definitely welcome an email and we would reply back and, and help you to get involved. And the email would go to ECJP, Environmental and Climate Justice Program, ECJP, at naacpnet.org, so naacpnet.org. Thank you so much. That sounds like an amazing project, and if there's anything we can do to help you, please let us know. And I'm so grateful for your time and your labor, just sharing all this information. It's really, really helpful. Um, yeah. Thank you for your interest. We appreciate it. Welcome to the Food Justice Film Festival. I'm sitting down tonight with Giovanna Johnson Cook and Eugene Cook, and I'm super excited that they're going to join us. Giovanna Johnson Cook is a vegan chef and food justice advocate working in Atlanta. She established My Two Foods in 2008 in response to the need for healthy lunch options at a local school. Giovanna also co-founded Grow Where You Are, an Atlanta-based growers collective with her husband, Eugene Cook. They also work together on their five-acre wooded retreat farm and indigenous native African homestead on Stone Mountain called Awali. Since 2009, Grow Where You Are members have trained more than 100 urban farmers and helped start 18 urban farms, 14 school gardens, and 40 home gardens. They also create community food sovereignty and prepare free vegan feasts for the local community, which sounds amazing, where neighbors gather together uh, to learn about health, make new friends, and even practice coquera, an Afro-Brazilian martial art form and dance. So I hope I got all that right. Welcome. Yeah, you did. Well done. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Yeah. So that is just really inspiring, and I would love to hear more about all of that. Um, starting out, I think, Giovanna, one of the one of the things I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about is in my two foods. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Um, it's served more than 2,000 plant-based meals to school children. And I know that the Atlanta Public School District, for example, um, is struggling with some of their lack of equipment and, and changing the menus. And, and I've tried to get involved in that too. So I'm so thrilled to hear that. Can you talk a little bit about that kind of work and your inspiration to start My Two Foods? Wow, um, it's, I, the interesting thing is, is that that number was in, I believe, that was maybe four or five years ago. So <laughs> it's actually increased from 2000. Oh. So whatever it is now, um, 
and I'm super grateful to be able just to do that work and to have that exchange within the community. Um, how it started was I was um, I was pregnant with my son, with our son, um, our first son, and um, it was just like, what kind of work can I do that was in line with what we were developing as far as um, just just our, within our own life, just eating healthy, um, being plant-based, but also that worked in tandem with Eugene farming um, within the community. And also at the time um, we were both uh, teaching um, and working at a school, um, doing agricultural work. And so um, Eugene suggested the idea, well, how about, you know, you make some meals and offer it to the school who didn't have a lunch program and so we pitched the idea of doing a plant-based lunch program for them and they were like on board. I think initially it was, we were, it came in kind of slow because uh, you know, they weren't plant-based, but I think after like the first couple of days that we served meals, <laughs> yeah, <they laughs> within, were. within the week, by the end of the week, we had the whole school and then we had the, the nursery as well. And, and then, then some parents. And over the course of time, <laughs> then parents got involved and we started, that's when our home delivery service kicked off as well. So. It just kind of just organically grew from us just trying to figure out how we could be a benefit to our community utilizing the skills that we were honing within our home. Um, and uh, we were fortunate that our community was open to it mm -hmm. and has continued to be open to it over the years. Yeah, what do you attribute to that openness? There wasn't a resistance, you know, some school projects I've worked on have, have had some resistance to that. Um, well, with this particular school, I think the test was really just how the food tasted, but also mm -hmm. because we were utilizing the food in the garden from the program that we were doing at the school. Mm -hmm. So it was a way to like get the children involved, to get the community involved or the school parents and the school involved, just having a hand in their food. So I think just the inclusion of people um, into what they were eating um, and just different practices of like being self-sustainable I think mm -hmm. that was what was really the, the draw, what the catch was, was that people just wanted to be involved and engage more with their food and we offered that, so, yeah. And, and why do you think, maybe just explain for people who, who aren't in your situation, you know, with children and the community and access to food and um, just why schools would be so important and have such a powerful impact on all of these things, you know, food sovereignty, community building, healthy foods for children, environment, you know. I'm kind of saying that, but like, you know, what's your perspective on, on why schools are, are so important? Well, schools are already, I mean, they're set up, they're, they're centers for education. They're centers where you're going, where you're supposed to be going to learn how to enhance your life, to develop yourself. So I think they are prime places just to continue that development with essential life skills, which is what eating is. And like to us, growing food is also an essential life skill. So I think because they are educational institutions, um, they're already primed for just adding on additional information to better your life, to further educate yourself. And when you're dealing, especially when you're dealing with children who are also op just open-minded anyway, and you're involving them and engaging them, especially in urban communities into something that they can have a, I guess you would say maybe a rural experience or a really like just in tune with earth experience right. within their, their urban setting. Um, children are open to that because I mean, children are open to, to most things, um, especially exploration and just new discoveries. So I think that that's um, why schools can be an ideal place for that type of, this type of work because it's, they're already, you know, set up for education and learning and development. Yeah. Yeah. And are there obstacles with funding? Um, how do you how do you get around these lack of um, you know equipment, for example? Uh, maybe they don't have dishwashers or staff training, or you know, um, the USDA has, has like described what school food should be, right? So how do you work with that to make sure Ooh, it's, it's a good? climb? It's a climb, mm -hmm. but it offers up the space for innovation and ingenuity and just really just kind of digging deep into like just finding purpose and finding a way to make a way out of what would seem like dire situations just mm -hmm. trying to figure out it's just it's it's really a um it's like a, a class in development mm -hmm. um and it's i how can i say this it's what i'm learning is 
how to develop systems by having to develop a system because help is not has not always been um like hasn't always been there it's mm -hmm. been a struggle i mean we've done things bare bones um for the majority of the time that we have been working um within the community because of i mean we, don't, we didn't have a lot of support from say like your usda or government assistance it was all us coming together within with people within our community or people who supported the work that we have been doing and just gathering resources that way and just doing the best that we could with what we had so mm -hmm. it's yeah it's it, it, it's it was it's tedious it can be tedious it's a lot of hard work but it i think it builds character at least i'm hoping that it builds character <laughs> um and hopefully um just the way that we have been doing the way that we've learned is it, setting a blueprint mm -hmm. so that whoever's coming up behind us it won't be as difficult because mm -hmm. you know we kind of we went through it you know and yeah. so <laughs> yeah. yeah so hopefully we can give them some pointers on how to you know navigate through these systems and still you know have something that's integral to your work and your ethics and your you know your community yeah. and still function and still mm -hmm. work <laughs> It yeah. sounds like you've been pretty successful so far and it's really exciting and I can hear your enthusiasm and I'm excited about it, but it also sounds like it's a lot of hard work and I know Eugene came home the other night late and, you know, working on a food forest and a beginner farm and all this is hard work. It is not just theoretical. Can you talk about the hard work and also what excites you and, and keeps you going through that? Well, what keeps me going through the hard work is the same thing, that, the same reason I started farming is it's the family. Um, there are people who are in the food system now who have started because they went to school for agriculture or they went to school for social justice. My way of starting, I started farming when I became a father for the first time. And so my oldest son is 21 years old. So that tells you how long I've been doing it. So what keeps me going is the fact that we, we've built our family around this lifestyle. So similar to what Giovanna was saying earlier, we are taking the life skills that we find essential for our own lifestyle and for our own children and projecting it out into a vocation and an enterprise. Um, when it comes to urban farming and local food systems, it's fundamental and we, it's ahead of the curve for a lot of people's thinking. And so it requires us to be patient, um, patient yet active because farming is very much about timing every season there's a there's certain time windows and if we miss those time windows there will be no food for a couple months so we have to be consistent about those time windows and then patient with the partnerships that we're developing because many people that we're partnering with organizations and things they work on a different time scale they work on um what do they call that clock fiscal a, a fiscal clock they work on not clocks calendars I guess. Calendar, yeah. yeah they work on different calendars we work on a lunar solar calendar they work on a fiscal calendar and people want to get things done at this time or that time you know i have people calling me at, in january asking me for okra and uh you know it's the <laughs> okra is a summer crop so <laughs> you want okra in january you're going to get it in the frozen section like everybody else so there's that kind of patience with understanding that we have um, as Giovanna was saying earlier about developing this system, we're not only going to work and doing our work every day, we are creating the system for our work as we go to work, which is somebody was saying, it's kind of like building, it's like we're building a car while we're, try, while we're driving down the street. You know what I mean? We have the wheels on it, we have the engine on, on in it, it's running as a steering wheel, but now while we're driving, we're upholstering the seats and we're putting on doors and putting headlights on that's what's literally happening and what the only thing that can keep somebody going in that is like a deeper spiritual motivation to serve and for most of us service comes with our family first and then it blossoms out um and matures to where we start to serve our communities yeah and you do so much for the community can you talk a little bit about that i've mentioned a few things but the trainings the workshops the feeding mm -hmm. people um, you have a plant-based pregnancy program that I'm interested in. Yeah, we have a partner um, organization, a well-fed world, and a well-fed world is a plant-based food justice organization. They deal a lot with plants for hunger, 
And so we have been in partnership with them, I think for about five, six years now, five years, six years now. And that's been a really good partnership because they have come in and looked at um, existing programs that we have, like farmer training programs, the mother's meal programs. They've looked at programs that are existing and just asked us, what do you need to make it stronger, to make it more robust? And that's been very helpful. So um, this year we did a program, a strategic initiative with the partnership with uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Culture of Health Leaders, and we did something called Growing Options. And Growing Options was training, and we're still doing it, we're finishing it up probably around October, um, training young people 18 to 36 who are interested in understanding the food system, training them with growers, with chefs and distributors, and then helping them understand enterprise, basic um, how to start your own business, your own enterprise, how to keep records, how to document your work. And so that's how partnerships work with other organizations, looking at existing programs and initiatives that we have, and then asking us, how do we expand that budget? And we're always ready for that, always ready for that. And for the programs with here at Awali, it's, a lot of it is really um, centered around mothers and children, and just really getting children and mothers outside in the garden, um, getting them out of the city and letting them um, just be on the land and explore and enjoy. But also um, we love to feed people when they come. So <laughs> we do a lot of <laughs> programs or just have events where people come and we just all get together, we garden, and then we have an open fire outside and we just make plant-based meals together or we have gatherings um, when we have speakers that come into town and we have big gatherings where the community can come out and interface um, with those uh, speakers or writers or farmers. Um, and just so just allow people to have community mm -hmm. and build community around healthy living, around um, love and care for the earth, mm -hmm. um, honoring and respecting the earth and all of its creatures and just really just com creating community. So. And then that also extends into the work that we do as far as a mother's program, um, the postpartum program, because it's still really about creating community and letting mothers know, letting postpartum mothers and pregnant moms know that, hey, we are here to support you in this tremendous journey because mm -hmm. they are contributing to community by birthing babies. So in that way, you know, we want to be able to give back in that sense, but we want to make sure that the food that we're giving them is in our you know in our hearts and minds ethical it's in line with you know and in tune with the earth and in balance um so that we're always giving life um and not taking away from life especially when we're feeding you know our mothers and our children so and then just teaching that kind of not necessarily teaching but just showing through example that kind of you know um example because we don't want to like um like preach Right. anyone but we you know but we offer the space and offer the opportunity to observe and right. or hopefully through maybe like osmosis maybe just through having the experience you know they can carry that out into whatever it is that they're doing and just begin to maybe shift their way of thinking and you know be open to yeah. new ideas for some yeah, Jamal, thank you so much. You you kind of answered my, my next question there a little bit, who was going to be about how the realities of, of Black, Latino, Indigenous, immigrant community, communities of colors and the disproportionate impact of animal agriculture, you know, mm -hmm. toxins, um, lack of access to food, and these kinds of things are outrageous and wrong and frustrating and negative and, and people talk about it a lot like that and I talk about it a lot like that but you are kind of bringing this positive aspect to it and like you're saying osmosis and the experience of positivity and, and connecting to the earth and that's it just really is inspiring and I think that's more probably more useful yeah mm -hmm. yeah what's important um, is for us to realize that we we are in a majority right and being in a majority means that what we prioritize especially with the mothers and the children that's the quickest way to see transformation because it's the same way we've all been transformed and brainwashed right 
the way I was transformed and brainwashed was that I was allowed access to certain media as a child. So even though I had my two parents who were setting a particular example, they might have been the only four or three or four adults around in my community where my aunts and my, my parents that were setting this example. Meanwhile, the television had me for however many hours a day giving me this other experience, right? And it's, you know, they say that this, the, the mind cannot differentiate what it sees from what it's experiencing. So since we take in 70 to 80% of our information through our eyeballs, if we're watching something and we're watching violence or we're watching wars or whatever we're watching, we, our mind, our subconscious mind says, this is an, a real experience for me. And so then it starts to train us. My, one of the brothers that um, is a construction work, uh, uh, designer for the projects that we work on, greenhouses and things like that, he said he remembered back in the 80s um, coming home and his, one of his cousins was playing video games, playing video games, playing video games all day long. And he said, man, what are you doing? Why are you playing these video games so seriously? He said, I'm being paid for this. So he was being paid very early on to, to test out the video games were not, that were not video games. They were simulations for the controls that were going to be used in military aircraft, right? And he got into a program because of he was in college to test this out as a video game so they could fine tune the software for this military equipment. Mm -hmm. So when Giovanna says we're creating these experiences, if you, have the, if you get a, a generation of children, even if they're growing up in, in a time where, where, especially maybe, if they're growing up in a time where people have to wear masks and things like that, and they can come to a space like a Wally, mm -hmm. jump on the trampoline, go out into the forest, pick blueberries, figs, and peppers, right? See this for themselves. Nobody can snatch that back from them. Mm -hmm. Nobody can take that out of their head. They know for a fact that figs grow on trees, that blueberries grow on bushes. They know this because they've experienced it. And then they're going to want to replicate that experience. So that means what we have to do as the adult population is invest in more spaces like this. So that then if they travel, if your children grow up and travel, you can say, oh, you're traveling to this state, in this state, we have a network, you can go to this space. And if you go to this space, you're gonna have this kind of experience with natural food, plant-based living, right? This much time outside, you might be sleeping in a tent, all this kind of thing. And you know that it's safe because it's a network that has been created over time. We feel that that's part of our responsibility with Awali. And Awali, the word itself means the source. It's an East Afri African, East African word that means the source. That's beautiful. So what advice would you have for someone, you know, in your shoes 21 years ago who thinks, I, you know, food sovereignty is important and I want to be able to grow my own food and I live in that urban environment. And so what do I do? What's your advice? I think you should speak to this. I would say that the first thing is to, thankfully you have, many people have access to digital research. So do some basic research of farmers markets in your area, community gardens in your area. And if possible, there may be some um, agricultural schools or agricultural centers in your area and begin by going and volunteering. And if it's a farmer's market, yeah, you can volunteer at farmer's markets as well, or you can go to that farmer's market and just shop with the farmers and ask the questions that you are, cons are interested in and ask if these farmers have times when they do farm tours or volunteer days. Many farms are not necessarily education centers, but they may have two, one or two events a year as fundraisers or um, as celebrations, harvest celebrations, and be proactive, um, especially in an urban environment. Just be proactive, do the research, figure out where these are in your community, and go start to check them out face to face. This is not something that you want to do on Instagram. You want to do it on Instagram after you've already found the real spaces in, in your in your area. I'll speak to like just mothers. Uh, there's so much power. Um, there's so much um, that can happen within community, finding other people in your neighborhood or in spaces like outdoors though. Um, when you go outdoors, you meet all kind of interesting people. And I know a lot of the work that we have done that I've gotten into, I've met the people that I work with 
in outdoor spaces, whether it's at the farm or it's at parks where I'm taking kids to go on the swings or it's just, to me, it's always going to come around um, and center within community. Um, I think we, we're kind of being motivated to have such isolated individual lives. And that takes us out of so many conversations and takes mm -hmm. us out of so much essential work that can be happening um, cooperatively mm -hmm. um, because we are, you know, living these single sol solitary lives. Um, but there's so much power in collaboration, so much mm -hmm. power and in information in cooperation. And so I think if we just allow ourselves to come out of our shells and, um, and just also just be open to ideas that may be different from what we have been taught Mm -hmm. are you know raised up on and just be open-minded to others ideas because there's so much there's beauty in the exchange of information and we can learn so much and we and i think that's how we can continue to develop culturally and as a society if we remain open to one another's ideas um yeah so that would be my advice just to stay mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. and to stay present and go outside. <laughs> go outside. Go outside. Yeah. I know it's kind of hard right now, just considering <laughs> like um, what's happening with the health crisis, but uh, there's still opportunity, I believe, in that. Um, this is an opportunity for us, I think, especially those of us who um, are like bearing witness to the movements that have to deal with animal rights, that have to deal with a plant-based living, just pay attention to what's happening on an environmental level um, uh, and just really hone in and kind of like sharpen up our tools in a way um, mm -hmm. and really connect and like have the conversations that we're having today. Mm -hmm. Cause this is a, another link, you know, in the chain that only mm -hmm. makes us stronger um, as a wider community, hopefully a worldwide community so that this work progresses and moves forward, you know, until we get everybody on board mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and begin to actually, make active change because that's you know what we need i think yeah, this is and i think it's it's really important too to rethink what farming is if farming doesn't have to right. be exploitative right and who and what and how farming is it's, it's really important to normalize for other people in, in different ways than we're used to what you were both saying so i appreciate that and um just to to close up i think my son is walking in the door now um how can we follow you and support you online social media so I'm at Mayato Foods, uh, so M-A-I-T-U-F-O-O-D-S. That's Instagram, not really Facebook, but yeah, mostly Instagram um, when I get a chance to get on there. And then, oh, a website, www.mayatofoods.com. That's again, M-A-I-T-U-F-O-O-D-S.com. Yeah, yeah, and grow where you are. <laughs> grow where you are. We're very active on Instagram, and we also have a Patreon account, and the Patreon for Grow Where You Are it covers Maitu Foods, it covers um, different vegan chefs, different training programs, medicine makers, lots of folks that we partner with. It's a good way to see what we're doing. And the website, because you're in there. Yeah, growwhereyouare.farm. Giovanna found a dot .farm <laughs> website, so we're, yeah, we're good. It's like our Thank you thing. so much. It is. It's <laughs> one of many. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Those are wonderful. Thank you so much, and, and we'll be in touch soon. Thank, Thank you. you. This is beautiful.